Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Museum of the United States Army's Virtual Book Talk, The Indispensables with Patrick K. O'Donnell. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It's so great to have so many of you with us to hear this presentation. Please pardon our technology problems that we are having this evening. Um, but we don't want to keep you from hearing what is going to be a wonderful presentation uh, this evening by Patrick K. O'Donnell on the Indispensables, the diverse soldier mariners who shaped the country, formed the Navy, and rode Washington across the Delaware. And it is my pleasure to welcome um, Patrick O'Donnell um, to joining and thank him for joining us this evening. And so without further ado, um, welcome, Patrick. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor to be here tonight. So can you tell us a little bit about um, your work and this book? Because we're so excited to hear more about it. Sure. Um, this is my, I'm a military historian, and this is my 12th book, my uh, 12th best-selling book, actually, and the Indispensables has actually gone through about eight print runs already. And um, it's... It's a it's an important story, and I ask a single question before I write any book: Who cares? And who cares is it, the indispensables is it, the story of the indispensables is unfolding in front of our eyes in many ways. We're living through a pandemic, the same as the indispensables did, and I'll get into that later, as well as withdrawing under fire and the difficulty of that. And let me just kind of go right to that moment. And let me take the, the, the viewers to the summer of 1776, August 1776. And at this point, it's the Battle of Brooklyn. On August 27th, the battle unfolds. It unfolds in a watermelon patch of all places. And uh, it's here that Lord Howe Clinton and the bulk of the British Army are making a flanking maneuver around the Heights of Guanas. And uh, this is basically surrounding a large portion of the American Army, which is out on this rocky height, uh, outcropping. That morning, around 4 a.m., the Americans are alerted to this battle and assume, uh, you know, march as quickly as they can to defensive positions around a place called Battle Hill, which is now. Uh, Greenwood Cemetery, and it's here that the Americans, um, primarily led by Lord Sterling, um, and a, this contains a contingent of Delaware, a regiment of Delaware uh, troops, as well as Marylanders, Maryland Continentals, and they face off against a force led by General Grant. And this is actually just a, 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 a holding action on the part of the British. They're trying to pin us down as this main flanking maneuver comes around and it surrounds these men. And these men realize to their shock and horror that they are surrounded and they have to fight their way out. They fight their way back, specifically the Marylanders in particular, fight their way back towards their encampment, which was a, is a stone house, it still exists, or portions of it exist today. And it's here they fight an American Thermopylae. This is the bayonets of the revolution that allow us to have an hour more precious in our history than, in it, than any other, as one historian put it. This American Thermopylae allows time to be bought and allows a gap, it, it creates a gap in the British lines that allows a large portion of the right wing of the, of the American army to escape to their entrenchments at Brooklyn Heights. And that is where we are. This is a crucial inflection point in the American Revolution. All can be lost, everything. If um, and Washington has a crucial decision to make, does he stand and fight or does he retreat? And that retreat falls upon the shoulders of the men that I write about, the indispensables. This is the Marblehead Regiment that literally the Revolutionary War is on their shoulders to survive. They have to row the army across the East River, which is a mile long, and they don't even know it at this time. They are reinforcing Brooklyn Heights on the 28th. They go into the trenches and the, the spirits of the army are immediately lifted. They say, wow, these are the lads that might do something. 
And little do they know, um, they go into the entrenchments and the American army and the British army are pelted by a nor'easter that um, you know, floods the entrenchments and both armies are water sogged. And, uh, but meanwhile, Lord Howe continues a siege upon the heights of Brooklyn. He feels that the American army is trapped and there's no escape because the Royal Navy is parked on the East River and they're able to potentially come up behind the heights, the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights and uh, annihilate the, British, the American army as, as, as Howe comes forward um, in a land assault. And um, it's on the, the night of August 29th, um, the American Dunkirk, a miracle takes place, arguably the, um, the greatest evacuation in American history. It's here that John Glover's men, these Marbleheaders, that are roughly 600 men, uh, they come from Marblehead, Massachusetts. And this is, a, you know, about 16 miles as the crow flies north of Boston. And it's the second largest city in Massachusetts. And it's also, it's one of the most uh, profitable uh, centers for commerce in Massachusetts. They're, they derive their living from fishing and trade. Uh, a large portion of the Massachusetts economy comes from fishing. And these men fish a place called the Grand Banks. This is, these are the most treacherous waters in the world, still to this day. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's about a thousand miles north of Boston uh, in, the, in the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And, you know, the men fish uh, cod, which in most cases can be up to two or 300 pounds. They're massive, 100 pound cod that they fish. And they have to also brave uh, waves and, and sea. You know, every year, scores of men die at sea. But this is which, what hardens these men. It makes them the, the greatest mariners in the colonies as well. They learn to work as a team uh, very effectively. Life and death decisions are made instantaneously. Um, and they also happen to be a diverse regiment. In other words, there are African-Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic Americans as well working side by side with uh, their white uh, brothers. And these men are a well-oiled team, a, an incredible, uh, there's inc incredibly led and disciplined and they need it on the night of August 29th because everything goes wrong. The East River is treacherous. It is filled with, you know, it's overflowing with, with water from the Nor'easter, the tides and currents are swelling the boats. Um, they, 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 they are ordered that night with only two hours of preparation to evacuate 9,500 Americans and their equipment. That includes all of the wounded and the sick. It is practically mission impossible. They are told that they are advancing when in reality they are, they are withdrawing towards the river. The rest of the army is also told that they are advancing, but in reality, they are also evacuating. The reason being operational security. Washington knows a single traitor, either in the army or loyalists outside, can destroy and blow the entire operation. And that's exactly what happens at that night. It's attempted at least. A loyalist sees what's going on and sends an enslaved, um, one of their enslaved servants to notify the British. That individual though, um, runs into several Hessian soldiers. They, do, they are not able to communicate and the intelligence, this vital intelligence is not properly communicated up the chain of command. Still the evacuation proceeds, everything is going wrong, nothing is going right. The tides aren't working, the boats aren't going out, still they press forward. At that point, the commander of the operation, General McDougall literally tries to call it off. They try to find General Washington, they can't find him that night, things proceed forward. And the Marbleheaders push on. They are able to get across the East River with the first complement of the artillery and some of the wounded men, and then they go back. And this process repeats itself 11 times. They go back and forth across the river. And it is incredibly difficult because the wind it, it initially does not cooperate with John Glover's Marbleheaders. And um, they're, they're straining with oars. They actually literally covered their oars with cloth to muffle the sound because the slightest sound could alert a massive 20,000 man army that is right on the 
right next to the Continental Army. And if they attack at night, they could potentially crush Washington's, um, the, the bulk of Washington's army and potentially even capture Washington, thereby ending the revolution. Um, but the, the, the evacuation proceeds and against all odds, against all odds, the, the, the currents aren't working, but suddenly the wind does change and many of the boats have sails and they're able to catch a favorable breeze or wind that propels them across and they continue to go across back and forth right under the eyes of the British. Meanwhile, the British fleet, which is parked on the East River to their left, if they're, they're evacuating towards Manhattan, is um, about to pounce, but the wind doesn't favor their sails and they're not able to, to sail up the river. Miraculously, because had they been able to do that, they would have blown this tiny flotilla to smithereens. They're able to continue to evacuate but it's a race against time. And that, that is not only the, the British army, which is right on their, uh, on their necks, but also dawn is coming in with it light. And with that, that'll expose the entire operation. But um, as um, the men evacuate, there's chaos in the um, debarkation point. This is, this is actually the, um, the point now that this took place is one of the narrower points in the East River as it goes to the crossing to uh, Manhattan from Brooklyn. And that is now the current day location of the Brooklyn Bridge. And that night uh, there was chaos um, in the uh, embarkation area, but it was the commander in chief himself that was one of the last men to leave. True leadership. George Washington is there and uh, displays an incredible um, amount of personal leadership and courage to restore order. He literally takes a massive boulder and raises it above his head and says that he will sink the, the, the boat to hell in front of him if there's not order and it's not restored. And, and sure enough, you know, with the commander in chief's charisma and gravitas, they're able to, he's able to restore order and the men continue to, to cross. And it's at that point as dawn is coming, the first rays of dawn, a, a fog, a providential fog, as the men that were there described it, comes in and screens the movement of the remainder of um, the evacuation and thereby saves the Continental Army um, in the American Dunkirk. But that's hardly um, the end of the story. Uh, and what we find is the, Merrill, the, um, the marble headers are at the uh, vortex of battle on many, many occasions. They also play so many vital roles in the American Revolution um, from the very beginning. And um, let me sort of go back in time to that beginning and why they fought. Why they put their fortunes, their lives, their livelihoods, their honor, everything on the line for a cause in a country that had really just been born. And it was them, they had played a absolutely crucial uh, role in that, in this American revolution uh, from the very beginning. And the Indispensables opens with a very um, compelling scene. That scene is in 1769 on the rolling deck of a, a boat, a schooner called the Pit Packet. And the Pit Packet was returning from Spain with a uh, supply of salt. Salt happened to be, you know, as an incredibly important preservative. Um, and it was incredibly important for preserving the fish that these men had uh, caught at the Grand Banks and that they would barrel and then send around the world and trade it for other goods. And they would trade it for some very important commodities uh, including gunpowder, something we had, we did not have a supply of, at least organically, or a production of in the colonies at that time, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, on the pick packet, though, that day, as they're coming back from Spain with this uh, supply or load of salt in the, um, in the hull of this ship, they are suddenly boarded, or they, they're called upon by a Royal Navy ship and um, they're boarded immediately. And this is not a friendly boarding. 
the men all know exactly what it's about. It's not to inspect their goods and potentially, you know, throw some regulations at them. No, this is something called impressment. An impressment is effectively slavery. And if you're impressed upon the Royal Navy, in the Royal Navy, you never go home. In fact, in most cases, you're paid a pittance. Uh, your wages are withheld for about six months before you even get anything, just so that you don't run away. And if you run away, you potentially get killed. Um, but you're, in, you're basically enslaved into service or impressed into service upon the Royal, the Royal Navy ships. And the Royal Navy had so many ships that they needed men and bodies to crew them. And they scoured the earth for, for individuals. And in fact, up to 30 or 40% of the ships in the Royal Navy at this time were, were impressed men, including these marble headers that, that is where they were headed. But instead of going willingly, they decided to fight back. And it's quite a dramatic story. The, um, a bag of salt spilled across the front of the deck. And as the officer, the boarding officer came aboard, he said, um, you know, you're, you're coming with us. And the, one of the main characters in my book, Michael Corbett, said, um, if you cross the line, and he literally took his foot and drew a line in the salt on the deck of the pit packet. He said, if you cross the line, you're a dead man. And these men were armed with harpoons and hatchets and other things that fishermen normally have. And uh, this royal officer was very arrogant. He took a little whiff of snuff and crossed the line. And as soon as he did that, he had a, a, jug, he had a, a, a harpoon in his carotid artery. And uh, he screams out, the rascal killed me, as he falls to the, the, the deck, bleeding to death. And that is the beginning of the Indispensables. It's a story of men uh, fighting back against tyranny. And this is a, a, a story about people fighting back against tyranny uh, because they're afraid for their lives. And uh, they're also being excessively regulated by um, a government 3,000 miles away where they don't have any representation at all. And there's a number of atrocities and massacres that take place and other incidents that will accelerate um, the situation, which I get into the, in the book. But um, after the incident with the pick packet, we have um, one of the other characters in this book is John Adams. And he is arguably America's first super, super lawyer. And it's John Adams that, that gets Michael Corbett, who threw that harpoon um, off uh, for murder. And he, they're tried for murder. And it's um, evidence that John Adams presents, as well as a very compelling argument that, the, um, that allows Michael Corbett to be exonerated of his crimes. Um, but this was initially for 1769, one of the crimes of the colonies or one of the crimes of that century. And it was a very, very big deal. But <clears throat> further incidents would, and atrocities in particular, would accelerate um, the clash that would eventually occur, which we now know is the Revolutionary War. And uh, the revolution, though, is starting to brew at this time. And uh, one of the major high points or low points is the, what's known as the, the Boston Massacre. And it's here that um, a number of unarmed Americans, including a, the first African-American, Crispus Attucks, is killed. And one of the main characters in this book, who has very extensive links to Marblehead uh, through his, his um, friendship with several doctors that are main characters in this book, but also his mistress, which happens to be in the town of Marblehead, and that is Benjamin Church. And Dr. Benjamin Church is a renaissance man. He's extraordinary. He's able to write poetry. He's able to, to write um, books. He's able to, um, he's considered one of the greatest physicians in, in the colonies. He's, you know, on the surface, an ardent patriot, but Dr. Church has a very dark side. And uh, as I get into in the book, and uh, Dr. Church, though, is the first individual and the individual that actually conducts the autopsy on Crispus Attucks. And this continues, um, you know, additional things continue to fuel 
um, a, a, a thirst for liberty um, and a thirst for um, for individuals that are they're fearing for their lives in many ways and their livelihoods as I get into. Um, you know, additional things occur, including um, the Boston Tea Party. Many of, uh, several of the men that are in the Marblehead Regiment or eventually were, are in the Marblehead Regiment later on, take part in the Boston Tea Party. And the Tea Party um, is, you know, it's initially, it's, it's, it's complicated in many ways. It's about um, the sale of tea and, how it's going to be through the uh, a single monopoly, the East India Company, and there's a number of things that are taking place. In many ways, you can boil it down to Americans don't like to be told what to do. And they're being told what to do. They're being regulated excessively. And they decide to take matters in their own hands. They, they take um, tea that's in, in on a several ships that are in Boston Harbor, and they throw them overboard into the, into the harbor itself and destroy thousands of pounds worth of really good tea. They do, they do it very deliberately though, in the sense that they don't have any wanton destruction of anything other than the tea. They're trying to they literally replace the locks on the ship after they remove the tea. They're not trying to harass any of the crew members on board the ships. It's done in a very deliberate manner. They're trying to make a point. But the point that is made to them is the crown. And the crown comes down with an amazingly heavy hand. They decide to close the entire port of Boston, throwing everybody out of work. Um, in a series of what's known as the Intarable Acts, they replace all the judges that are there with royal officials. These were initially elected officials before that. They replace the government. Uh, Massachusetts was largely self-governing at that time. They replace the government. They, they disband it. And um, life is becoming increasingly difficult. They also, for it, specifically with the Marbleheaders, they later create something called the Fisheries Act. And this is, they ban the Marbleheaders from fishing the Grand Banks. This shuts, will shut down the entire town. Everybody will go bankrupt and they know it. Um, the Port of Boston is out of work. You've literally thousands of individuals that are out of work and starving. Um, you have the intolerable acts that are coming in and the, um, the British also start to target the American Achilles heel. And that is a lack of gunpowder. And this is where the Marbleheaders play an absolutely crucial role that has never really been written about or research to, to a great extent and that is the supply of gunpowder. And it's these men, through their trading contacts, largely with Spain in particular, they have an incredible relationship with the great trading houses in Spain. And they convert these trading routes into supply routes where they are bringing in the vital supply of gunpowder. It doesn't matter if you want to revolt. If you don't have gunpowder, you cannot um, effectively protect yourself or do anything um, that goes against the crown will. And the, the crown knew this and were actively trying to disarm Americans. All of the early operations, beginning with the Somerville powder alarm, so-called, and this is on September 1st, 1774, the American, the revolution, which is political, which is peaceful, largely, um, is, is changed, forever changed. The colonists see that the crown is actively trying to disarm them. And what happens that night after Gage raids the powder magazine is they find out about it and rumors sw uh, swirl that six Americans were killed. It's actually false, but they didn't know it at the time. The rumor was that six Americans were killed. And a crowd of thousands of, of um, men from all and women from all over Massachusetts descended upon Boston Common. <clears throat> they were in some cases armed, but it was still largely peaceful. They, they surrounded the uh, officials' homes. Uh, and some windows were broken. I mean, there was a, it was pretty, uh, it was a situation where things were about to spiral out of control. 
And one of the main characters in this book, uh, Joseph Warren, emerges and uh, calms the crowd, says, look, this is, we're not about to uh, conduct violence. This is a peaceful protest. And um, they disperse the crowd. Um, but this is the beginning of the revolution changing from a political revolution about freedom and liberty and other, thought, other things that are really unique and novel for this time. One of the key members of this regiment is also a man by the name of Elbridge Gary, who will be the future vice president. But Elbridge Gary, his views on republicanism, this is with a small r, and this is about you know, service to, to individuals, service to country. It's about freedom and liberty, his views of freedom and liberty. This is something that is imbued in our founding ideals. Elbridge Gary and in the Marbleheaders play a major role in the political revolution that is, that is gelling in 1773, 1774. <coughs> um, but let me just back up one year and a few months, basically. And as this stuff is going on, you have these, these different um, atrocities, such as the, 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 um, the closure of Boston Port, the Intolerable Acts, in Marblehead in, 17, in the, in the uh, middle of 1773, 1774, the, um, the town, it, which actively trades around the world, it's, it brings in something, an invisible killer. And you've got all of these kind of factors going on, but layered upon that is a virus that is a deadly virus that is introduced to Marblehead. It's also introduced to the colonies. And it will play a key role in the, the, um, the American Revolutionary War. And it's a marble header that will save the army. Um, but in 1773, the virus hits Marblehead and they try to contain it however they can. This is before Jenner, they, before they understood what smallpox was, they tried to initially um, contain it by uh, what they call pest houses. And this is quarantine. They would quarantine individuals that had the virus and they would seal them off in houses. Um, but this didn't work. And it would be the patriots in the town who were the members of the Marblehead Regiment later that would come up with a novel idea. And that novel idea was very cutting edge at the time. And that would be an inoculation hospital. And they, they set up an inoculation hospital in a, on an island outside of Marblehead called Cat Island. And they built a hospital with their own money. And they financed the hospital and then they financed the doctor who would run that hospital. And one of those individuals is the main character of my book, Dr. Nathaniel Bond, who is an expert on, on viruses, specifically smallpox. And they were um, inoculating individuals, but this was... This was cutting edge science for the time, and it was dangerous work. It didn't always work. And uh, what happens, it's almost like a Russian roulette in some cases. Most of the time, the inoculation succeeded, but sometimes it didn't, and it could kill the patient. Because what they literally would do would take a knife and lance the top of your shoulder and place a small, tiny portion of the virus, active virus, in the body, and your body would create antibodies and uh, fight it off. Hopefully, sometimes it didn't work. And what, what went on, though, is that the virus divided the town politically. The loyalists in the town used the virus um, against the patriots of the town. And they organized a, um, initially a, a group of about a dozen individuals at the dead of night. They rode across the, bit, um, the, the harbor and they raided Cat Island and they torched the hospital with everybody inside. Uh, including women and children. And miraculously, nobody died. But um, this political violence uh, incinerated the hospital. Patriots lost all their money, and it slowed the efforts for inoculation. The Patriots obviously weren't very happy about this, and they, they went to the local sheriff, and they got a writ, and they arrested the individuals, the perpetrators, and they were brought to jail. But the Loyalists organized a massive mob of over 1,000 people and they stormed the jail with axes and crowbars and broke the individuals out, paraded them in the town, and then they assaulted the homes 
of, of the main characters in the book. They surrounded the homes of these men and uh, attempted to potentially kill them. And uh, this is where the main character of my book has an incredible stand. Um, he realizes what's gonna happen and he wheels a four pound cannon. Uh, this is a four pound being the, the size, the, the, the three pound cannon, I should say, three pound ball into the, into the foyer of his home and waits for the crowd to surround his, his house, get on the front lawn, and as he does that, he orders his front doors swung open and he has a lighted torch in his hand and orders the crowd to disperse. It's, it's really a, you know, really quite a, an epic stand and an example of his leadership and the crowd, um, they disperse and he holds his house, his, he stands his ground and holds his house. And um, the, uh, the men, the, the loyalists in the town have a brief victory uh, and they're able to politically control uh, Marblehead, but that's, that switches over uh, after the Boston Port Act. And it, the, the crown is, really falls into disfavor at this point. You know, people are really recognizing that their livelihoods are in danger and their lives are in danger because they're being actively disarmed and uh, you know, they're, they're fearing for their lives. Um, and that's where we come upon a series of what's known as powder alarms. And uh, the first being the Somerville powder alarm that I mentioned in 1774 in September. And it's followed by um, an attack on Fort William and Mary where the first shots are fired and the first blood is shed. And this is in December, 1774. And the Marbleheaders play a key role in this as well. Um, and one of the captains from that raid um, becomes a captain in the, uh, it's later the Navy. And I get into that in, uh, as well. But it's this quest for gunpowder. Gunpowder, it was my uh, editor's idea. Gunpowder is literally a character in the book because it's so important. It ties all of these uh, crucial um, operations together um, and, and the, the, this is very important because it's driving everything and this thirst for powder is driving uh, the Marbleheaders to seek it out in Spain and our first foreign aid comes from Spain in 1774. The powder supplies at Lexington and Concord which, are, which I later described are largely from the Marbleheaders and this is largely from uh, the, Sp the Spanish uh, that have furnished it with us, including weapons, small arms in, in cannon as well. And um, uh, Gage realizes his predicament. He has the, in a countryside of swarming with tens of thousands of armed Americans, but they don't have any powder. And he, um, he doesn't have enough troops though. He's only got about 4,000 troops to garrison all of North America. So he wants to buy time and potentially defang this revolution. And he continues to do surgical strikes um, that in many cases fail. Uh, there's after the, the Fort William and Mary uh, situation where the Patriots are able to get over a hundred barrels of gunpowder. Uh, another powder alarm occurs at Salem where the, the Gage tries to raid Salem, they land at near, in nearby Marblehead uh, to seize powder and it, it's a debacle. It doesn't work out at all. Um, and then it, it's, it's preceded by the operation at Lexington and Concord and supplying General Gage with all the, the vital information that he could ever want of where these supplies are located, who the ringleaders are, is Dr. Benjamin Church, who's sort of a, a central character in the book. He is um, close friends with the main, some of the main doctors in this book who are also the main leaders of the American Revolution. Dr. Joseph Warren is a very close friend of Dr. Benjamin Church, and he is a close friend of Dr. Nathaniel Bond. And Dr. Bond um, and Dr. Warren share a very interesting and unique um, side of them. They are what's known as resurrectionists. And this is a uh, 18th century body stature. 
these men in the name of science would go to graveyards to dig up bodies to, to, uh, to conduct autopsies. There, were no, there was no supply of bodies to conduct autopsies, so they did it covertly and they were part of a society uh, that was linked to Harvard. And uh, these close friends um, conducted that. And these close friends would also meet at Lexington and Concord. And it was here that they were all at the field of battle. And uh, it was here that they all did different things. It, you know, Warren had incredible leadership that day. Dr. Church was a phony and a fraud. He was literally um, trying to, 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 to feign that he was in the heart of battle. He literally sprinkled blood on his socks to, to make it feel like he was in the heart of battle. And then Nathaniel Bond was in the heart of battle. And he did something that um, got him canceled. And what I mean by that is he treated British soldiers. He treated British soldiers and American soldiers that day, according to his Hippocratic Oath. And he wanted to save lives. But for it, he was canceled. And what I mean by that is that the people there thought he was a loyalist. And, um, you know, it's quite interesting. His home was surrounded by an angry mob shortly after the battle. And I have an original four-page letter that he wrote to Elbridge Gary pleading with Gary that if he didn't send an armed uh, guard to his home, he would be dead in the morning because there were, there were, he said, thousands of people that were meant to kill him. And uh, they send a guard detail, and he testifies in a court-martial that he is innocent. And I think this is really one of the most extraordinary stories in The Indispensables. Instead of, you know, he, he was dishonored there. It was a situation where his reputation was smeared. Instead of just leaving the Red Revolutionary War, he went along with it. And he would become the fighting surgeon for the Marbleheaders. And um, he would fight through Lexington and Concord, all of the major battles, through the American Dunkirk, to where the final high point of this book is, occurs. And that is the 10 crucial days which make our country. And that is the battles uh, that surround Trenton and Princeton. And it's here on Christmas Day that the, the Marbleheaders are, you know, once again called upon by Washington to do the impossible. And that is to cross the Delaware River. And uh, it's in, in the middle of the Nor'easter. Again, the weather plays a major role. All of the other operations that weren't crewed by the Marbleheaders fail. Only the Marbleheaders and their boats get across and they have the main army. And they're at the top of Trenton, and they seize Trenton. And it's the Marbleheaders that play another key role that's not really written about, and that's that they seize arguably the most important real estate in North America, and that's the, the bridge over the Assunpeak Creek. So instead of a, um, a battle that is a, a win for the Americans, it is a crushing defeat for the British, uh, and specifically the Hessians. Uh, and they are surrounded by a double envelopment. Their escape route, they're pretty much their only escape route, or main uh, escape route, which is across the Aston Peak Bridge, is cut off by John Glover and his Marblehead men and his brigade. He's a brigade commander at this point. And uh, it's a crushing defeat. And the Marbleheaders then play a role in the Second Battle of Aston Peak Creek. Part of the regiment, um, their enlistments expire. And they go home. John Glover, for instance, has a ailing wife who is on her deathbed. And he goes home for her. The town of Marblehead is, is bankrupt. People are starving. So part of the regiment goes home, but others stay, including Dr. Nathaniel Bond and many others. And Dr. Bond saves the army with his actions. Because at this point, after the Battle of Princeton, they retreat. Um, to, Morris, to Morristown, and the army is being killed now by the silent killer, the invisible killer, the virus. It's killing up to 20% of the army. Um, people are, the, the, the men are dying left and right. And it's here that Washington um, orders the first national um, 
health order, if you will, and that is to inoculate the army. And he calls upon the most experienced virologist, the man that knows it, the man that saved or tried to save Marblehead, the man that was canceled initially, and that is Dr. Bond. And Dr. Bond um, sets up all the the inoculation hospitals. He personally conducts many of the inoculations. And for his service, uh, Dr. Bond also dies in his service to our country shortly after that inoculation. But Dr. Bond, many will, many will argue that Washington's decision to inoculate the army was probably his greatest strategic decision because it allowed the army to continue to fight um, when it was being killed by an, you know, a silent killer, a visible killer. But that's why these men are called the indispensables. And with that, I, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Patrick, for the presentation. And um, I want to ask the first question. Uh, when, we're, when we're looking at Civil War history, <clears throat> it's it's not all that difficult of a task to write a unit history, a regimental history or along those lines. But in the revolution, uh, the revolutionary period, we get very, very few regimental histories. And this is, this is one of the rare exceptions. So was this unit, the, was the Marbleheaders, Glover's Regiment, were, is there uh, more material out there than most other units? And if so, how did you get to that, uh, that research? And how did you find so much uh, material to, to write a book of this, uh, of this magnitude? Thank you, John. As you mentioned, um, there, are, uh, there are many uh, books in the Civil War that are regimental histories, but very, very few in the American Revolution. In my first book, Washington's Immortals, was a real breakthrough. It was one of the only um, regimental histories, but it's, this is, let me just back up one second. And this, for those that are listening, is a narrative history. It's kind of a band of brothers, if you will. It's a very, um, it's, it puts you in the boots of these men. It's not a pure regimental history in the sense of, you know, these men did this, this, and this, then, and then. It's, this is a narrative that is very fast flowing. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of interest from, on, the, on screenplays and everything else. But that's beside the point. What I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make is it's a um, kind of a band of brothers, if you will, narrative history of these men. But going to your question, it was extremely difficult, John. The um, Washington's Immortals was hard. Um, this book was maybe 10 times harder to write because there was fewer information. There was fewer information. And I had to dig. I had to dig. I had to scour the ends of the earth to find material for this book. And I, literally every individual in this book was a genealogy project. It was a genealogy project trying to find out what they did and then finding little tangents, little pieces here and there, and, um, and then connecting the dots. And then sometimes you would find a piece that was not related, but then it would be somehow, then it would be related. This is a complex kind of picture, a Roman mosaic that's 2,000 years old, that's shattered into 10,000 pieces or more that are that's scattered all over the place, and you're the guy that has to put it together. And that was, that was kind of where I was at. And I, was, I went through from all kinds of archives, from the New York Historical Society to the Beverly Historical Society, more Marblehead Historical Society, Peabody Essex, uh, British archives, you name it. Um, I was looking for it to reconstruct this story and um, into, a, a, into a narrative with an arc. And um, that was, that, that it, was it was exceptionally difficult. Um, but the... Uh, the reward, I guess, to some degree is I've had the town of Marblehead celebrate the book and really embrace it. And many of the families that I've written about in The Indispensables are still, still there. Um, in some cases, they've been in Marblehead for 13 generations as Americans. And that's just really wow. extraordinary to be able to, 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 to have that, that connection with them, yeah. too. 
Uh, before we go on to the next question, um, let me remind our audience members that if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll try to get to uh, your questions. Um, uh, Patrick, what happened to uh, uh, Glover after the war uh, and some of the other key figures um, that you came across? Is, there, is it easy to follow them, or are they kind of trail off? It, 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 it depends, uh, John. Like... Some of these men just disappear, and we don't know what happens to them. For instance, John Glover's son, who's a, a company commander and a fighting company commander throughout the entire war, he goes off to sea um, as a privateer. There, one part of this book I didn't even touch upon is that these men, in the quest for gunpowder, in, in, in Washington's quest for gunpowder, form what's known as Washington's Navy. And this, these are cruisers that actively try to seize British transport ships that are laden with powder. Um, and they form the origins of the US Navy as a result of that. But John Glover's son, after his, his, um, his role at Trenton, um, comes home and he's, he's a, he becomes a privateer. And Glover's son is lost at sea and never seen again. Um, many of these men uh, face a similar fate. And then you have men like Elbridge Gerry, who's a central character in this book, who becomes a, a congressman and then um, later governor of Massachusetts and then later vice president. And he plays a key role in the, the Constitution of the United States and in so many aspects of, of our government later on and in in the, the importance of, uh, you know, a decentralized government and having not being um you know not having a force control uh people etc sure. okay we have one question here uh, another one here is how long did it take you to write the book and by by right i suspect they mean including the research the writing how long was that process the book began i began writing the book in 2015 and I, um, I, start, I, write, I write two, two books at once. What, what I do there in some cases is I will, um, I will write one book and I'll do research on the other. And then I'll stop and then write and then do switch over. And, and I do that back and forth. And uh, it was a long process. And I also, I, I, I was really blessed to be a fellow, I'm a fellow at, at Mount Vernon at the library there. And I was, I was able to, to be in residence for six months and completely devote myself to this book uh, in 2019, which was just really a treat and just to be able to be on the grounds of Mount Vernon where, you know, Washington plays such a crucial role. We didn't even get to, you know, within this regiment was also something called the lifeguard that was formed. And this, the guard or Washington's guard was the, the, the personal guard of General Washington that guarded him, and some could argue was an early, early precursor of the Secret Service. They were a body of men. There were up to two, 200 men uh, that would that carry the, the, pres the, um, the commander in chief's papers, guard him, and also go on special missions. And they acted as his aides de camp and had authority to issue orders. And that's an amazing story in and of itself in this book as well. Uh, another audience member is interested in knowing about the uh, if the Marbleheaders played any role in the sailing of the USS Constitution. Not uh, not directly. I mean, it's possible that a Marbleheader may have been involved at some point, but this is further down the line, and I didn't even really get into the um, the summer of seventeen seventy five. You know, Washington comes into Massachusetts and Boston is surrounded by what they become, what becomes ultimately the Continental Army as well as all these militia groups. And, um, you know, to his horror, he finds out that he has, you know, his men only have 10, 10 rounds, 10 cartridges per man or 20. It's, it's a, you know, a box, hardly anything. Uh, and powder is a crucial supply that they don't have 
And it's Washington and that it's Glover and his men that actually are Washington's first guard. And uh, they form a special relationship. And it's, it's sort of surmised that that relationship is where Washington to ask Glover to um, form the first cruiser to go after these transport ships. And this is the origins ultimately of the Navy. And, uh, you know, it's a very, this is, that's an amazing story within this book and how these men took rotting tubs, you know, some really decrepit ships that only had four, four guns each and some swivels and, uh, you know, ultimately took on the mightiest Navy in the world at the time and tried to pick off some of their, uh, their vulnerable transports, which they did at the, the most crucial time of the war. They, they see some of the, the most the, 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 some massive power supplies that, that came from these ships that they seized and at the right time, at the right place. That's an, another uh, incru- an incredibly important element of this story is that these men mm-hmm. were uh, at the crucial inflection points of the war. So what are you working on now, Patrick? I am, uh, I am almost, well, I should say I'm well through. Uh, I've been working on it since 2016. I've got a book on the Civil War that I've been, it's a very special book. It's an untold story. And uh, it's, I can't get into too much detail, but it's, it's nearly there. And uh, I think it'll surprise a lot of people. Great. Well, Patrick O'Donnell, author of The Indispensables, The Diverse Soldier Mariners Who Shaped the Country, Formed the Navy, and Rode Washington Across the Delaware. I've read it, enjoyed it. I enjoyed the Maryland book, too. I have that on my shelf as well. We thank you very much for being here with us this evening, and uh, glad to have you. Uh, thanks to Jen Dubina, our producer, who um, got us on track. Uh, after some audio problems, but we're good to go. And finally, thanks again to Patrick O'Donnell for joining us and giving us this time. We really enjoyed it and um, hope to see you at the museum as soon as possible. Absolutely, John. And I would encourage everybody to visit the Outstanding Museum. And, and don't forget also, John, you've got a great book that's out on, on Guilford Courthouse. I encourage everybody to, to get that, a copy of that book as well. But it's really right, been an you, honor Jeff. tonight. Thank you so much, John, for having me in the museum too. All right. Very good, sir. Okay, to our audience, thank you for joining us again. And with that, uh, good evening, and uh, come back and see another one of our programs. Thank you.